die for our for our sins and our iniquities. As we sing this song, it's an old song, it's a familiar song. We would love for you all to sing it with us if you can. We would love for you all to stand with us. If you can, we'd love for you all to clap with us as we sing this song. All right, it says, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your sting? Sting, where is your grave? Grave, where is your victory? He got up. He got up. God raised him up. God raised him up. He got up. He got up. With all power. Say death, where is your sting? Death, where is your sting? Sting, where is your grave? Where is your grave? Grave, where is your victory? Where is your victory? Say he got up, got up. God raised him up. He got up, he got up with all, with all power. Back to the beginning, we say, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your sting? Sting, where is your grave? Grave, where is your victory? Where is your victory? You guys can help us on this Easter morning. He got up. God raised him up. God raised him up. Say, he got up. He got up. God raised him up. God raised him up. He got up, up, he got up, up. God raised him up. He got up, up, he got up, up. God raised, raised him up. He got up, 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 he got up, up, up. God raised him up. Yes, he got up, 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 up. God raised him up. We can do it four times. He got up, he got up, 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 up. God raised him up, he got up, he got up, 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 up. God raised him up. We can throw one more in there. He got up, he got up, 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 up. God raised him up, he got up. Say he got, he got up with all, with all power in his hands. Would you please uh, bow your head and close your eyes for a word of prayer? God, I just want to thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for putting food on our tables, clothes on our backs. Um, I thank you just for allowing us to strengthen our legs to just come here and worship you and sing about you this morning and just hope that somebody might be touched through our enthusiasm, through, through our message. Um, I just ask that you give all of us strength uh, during the week. Patience. I thank you for... Uh, I thank you for protecting me from danger seen and unseen. And I just ask that you just help me to let go and show up more of God, less of myself. These and all the blessings I ask in the name of our son, Christ Jesus, for his sake, amen. amen. This next song says, Lord, I lift your name on high. It says, Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life and I'm so glad you came to save us. And it says, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my debt to pay 
From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. This is another one of those songs that's very familiar. So this is the time of praise and worship. This is the time for us to give thanks to God for everything that he's done, everything that he's doing, and everything that he will do in the future. This is not a time for us to sit up here and sing to you all. This is time for all of us to sing and give thanks to God together. So for those of you that, that know the song, this old familiar song, we're asking that you all would help us out and sing it with us. Amen. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. And I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. We can do that again. Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. And Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. It says you came from heaven to earth. You came from heaven to earth to show. I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. And we say you came from heaven to earth. I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. We'll do that again. You came from heaven to earth. your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Say, Lord, I lift your name on high right there. Lord, I lift your name on high. Last time, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lisa and the Eiffel Tower. We consider these things grand and awe-inspiring, and we consider them great, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Now, today, the first selection by the choir is going to be called Masterpiece, and it talks about Jesus coming down 
and, and dying for our sins and our salvation. Now, the funny thing that I've realized about masterpieces on earth is that they are man-made, and they last for a substantial amount of time, but they never last forever. Jesus' masterpiece, which was him dying on the cross, is forever. You don't have to pay to see it. It's free to everyone. There's no restrictions, other, and there's no limits. It comes from the most humblest of beginnings, and everyone can relate, and everyone is appreciative of it. So right now, when you listen to this song, I want you to really reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for you. Don't think about what you wore today. Don't think about what you got cooking in the oven when you get home, unless it's on a timer. But um, just think about what de Jesus did for you, and enjoy the song. Thank you.
So he gave me Jesus to strengthen my feet of clay. Amen. God required that his son be the perfect sacrifice and in obedience to so great a love, Jesus gave his life. Jesus alone knows all that we go through. He has experienced happiness and hurt just like me and you. He stood up to power, betrayal, and loss, always being obedient to his self, no matter the cost. Whether clearing the temple of money changers and cheats of tuning two fish and five loaves into enough of thousands to eat, Jesus was motivated only to do what would ch change his father to say, this is my beloved son and I am well pleased with him. This is an everyday. Amen. Whether teaching his disciples, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, or even taking time to rest and have his needs attended to, he was met on every hand by those who meant to do him harm. However, Jesus stood firm. He knew who would pierce him in the side. He knew, he knew why his father had sent him. He knew his fate. He knew who would betray him. He knew who would nail him to the cross. He knew, he knew who would deny him. He knew who would be him. He knew who would crown him king of kings. He knew who would bind his hands. Yes, he knew who would crucify him. Yes, he knew who would crucify him.
the blood of Jesus that saves my soul. Yes, I know it was nothing but it was the blood that made me whole. With the blood of Jesus, I am made free from my sin with an everlasting prayer. Because Jesus died and rose and forever lives, I have the blessing of sure that only he gives. And eternal life is for all who believe. Death ha because death has been defeated, we do not have to grieve. Yes, Jesus did it all on Calvary. In obedience, he became the perfect sacrifice, the lamb without spot or blemish. He caused the veil of the temple to be forever torn into shreds, giving all who would believe in him as the only son of God, the power to come straight to him. He wrestled the keys of death from Satan. He arose victoriously. Many have died, but only Jesus rose on his own strength and power. He rightly is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Messiah, the Perfect One. Let me, let me repeat that over. The perfect one. Jehovah, our Lord, who has given us the promise of eternal life in the heavens with him. How wonderful to be able to call one so holy and righteous my personal savior. His only son, son, who gave his life for me way back on Calvary. There's no, no greater. life for me there is no no greater
There is nothing left for me but just the earth. Then that means that the story done end right. But he got up like he said he would. Thank God for Resurrection Sunday. Thank God for Jesus Christ. We want to thank all of our youth and our uh, young adults. The, um, the, I don't like to call them dancers, but the young uh, praise dancers, that's it. That, that makes it a little bit uh, more holy. Praise dancers and uh, for what they have given us and reminded us of that this is the Lord's day. In fact, really, when you think about it, every day is the Lord's day. We should carry forth this spirit in every day, every Sunday for the rest of the year. Because without his resurrection, the rest of the year has no purpose. It has no power. In conjunction with with the singing of the choir and the theme and the message that they have lifted before us, I would like to cooperate in terms of the physicality of Christ because I'm glad that, <clears throat> that the song went in the direction of the physical when it talked about they hung him high and they stretched him wide. And really the only way to really, um, from a believer's standpoint, 
to really appreciate and to deeply feel in terms of what Christ did. You have to look at the physicalness of what he went through and what he endured. And I'd like for you to turn to the book of Romans, the um, fifth chapter of Romans, verses 5, 6, 8, and 9. Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 5, and looking at verse 6, 8, and 9. Those four verses. And if you don't have a Bible, oh, get up on the board. You got me. All right. Let's begin reading together at the fifth verse. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth, verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So in if the reading of his word, you may be seated. Now, I want to reread those same verses from different translations. The Bible that I has, that I am using this morning, has about ten different translations, and it gives the translations for each verse. Going back to verse 5, where it says, And hope maketh not a shame, and our hope, another translation, cannot shame us in the day of trial. Or because the love of God has been poured forth in our hearts. Then verse 6. For while we were yet helpless in our sins, when we were utterly helpless with no way of escape, Christ, in God's good time, died on behalf of the godless. At the decisive moment, Christ died for us, godless men. And then verse 8, But God proves his love for us by the fact that Christ died for us when we were still sinners. And then verse 9, Much more than now that we have been pronounced righteous by virtue of the shedding of his blood, it is far more certain that through him we shall be saved from God's anger or God's wrath. Um, I've been reading for about the last month as much as I could consume out of different writers in terms of the, the trial, starting with Jesus in the upper room, sharing with his disciples the Last Supper, going through the trials, physical torture, through the crucifixion, and then finally the resurrection. And uh, I'd like for us, I'd like for you to journey with me. And let's, let's begin in the upper room with the Last Supper. 
known as the Passover meal. And uh, as you know, past several Sundays, Jesus predicted two people at that meal that would really do him wrong. And I'm using my own terminology. Judas would betray him. Peter would deny him. And it came true for both, that both of them, they fulfill his prophecy about them, let's say it that way. And as they finish the supper, they are going out into the cool dampness of the Palestinian air, walking down the dark cobblestone street, going across the book Kidron, up the slope of the Mount of Olives, where there was a private garden, where Jesus just this time didn't go, but he had been frequently visiting that spot. He'd been there many other times to pray. And all of the gospel writers, from Matthew to John, record in their own understanding through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in terms of what they wanted to pin for future generations to come. And when you put all four writers together, you get a beautiful composite picture of what happened to Christ from moment to moment, almost from hour to hour. We know that he prayed in the garden and his prayer was in three distinct areas, three different times. And when he went in, he had uh, admonished, he had instructed his disciples, please don't go, don't go to sleep. Stay awake. And I want you to be watchful. And I want you to pray. Because he knew that the hour of darkness was fastly falling on him. In fact, when he leaves the upper room, he tells Judas before Judas leaves ahead of them, he says, what you got to do, do it quick. And then the gospel writers denote the darkness that's getting ready to surround him and he said that Judas went out into the night and he wasn't just talking about uh, the physical night but he was talking about the blackness in that man's soul what he was getting ready to do he prays three times in the garden and after each prayer he comes back and the first time he finds them asleep he asks them, can't you not stay awake? He goes back and he prays, comes back again, still sleep. Goes back the third time, comes back, and he tells them, sleep on. It's all right now. <laughs> and <I'm, laughs> can I phrase it in my own terminology? When I needed you, you wouldn't pray with me, so I don't really need you now. My father and I, we've gotten it together. They leave the garden, and as they are there, they hear the sound of clanking swords, marching soldiers. They see torches in the distance. Men are coming. And when they come, Judas is standing with them. And they ask the question, they said, uh, Jesus, forgive me, Jesus asked them the question, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he responds, I'm he. And then the gospel writers tell us that they feel bad. And they don't really explain that, that physical action. But now you can interpret that in many different ways. And then he responds again by telling them, I told you 
you're looking for me. The rest of my brethren, let them go. You don't, you're not here for them. You're here for me. And then he makes a statement. He said, this is your moment now. The moment of darkness. In other words, this is your time. But also implied in his statement, my day is coming. So have your fun now, Satan. Do your best, do your worst, because after you finish, then I'm going to rise triumphantly. They arrest him. Now there are four trials that he goes through. The first one was with the, what we call the Jewish court, called the Sanhedrin, the high priest, Cepheus and Annas, and they questioned him along with the other rulers who were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they asked him stupid questions like, uh, are you the one that they claim to come? And then he responds, he says, now, I was in the temple every day teaching, and you never did lay a hand on me. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in the wrong, so to speak. Now you have arrested me. Now you had that opportunity, but you, you didn't touch me then. But gospel writers tell us the reason why they didn't arrest him then is because they were afraid of the crowd, that the people would ride, because Jesus did have some popularity. You've got to understand, he had healed a lot of folk. There were a lot of grateful people that loved him. So they didn't want that element of folk to cause any problems, any disturbance. So they wanted to do it secretly, privately, sneakily. So they questioned him. Now, it's about somewhere, let's look at the time, because the time is, is, is critical at, at, this, at this juncture. It's somewhere possibly about maybe 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And he's going through this first trial. Now, the thing about these trials that you got to remember, all four of them were illegal. They had no business uh, having those trials to come. First of all, if they had a trial, it was by law that the trial had to be announced before the trial. So the people who have an opportunity to come or the defense to sit in terms of, of uh, opposing prosecuting or defending. Secondly, there were no trials held at night. All the trials were during the daytime. So they broke all of the laws, their laws now. Their laws, remember. They had them at night and uh, they didn't announce them. They rushed them in. Counsel. Questioned him. And after, in fact, they had already convicted him before they brought him in. But they wanted to make it look, look, look legit, so to speak. But in their minds and their hearts, we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him. So we want to at least make it look palatable. So after they found him guilty, because the Jewish nation was under Roman authority, they could not execute capital punishment. They could sentence a person to be executed, but only the Romans had the power to execute the judgment. So, from the Sanhedrin, they sent him to Pilate. Okay, let's look at Pilate, his, his character for a moment. Pilate is the governor of Judea. And he's a Jew hater. He despises Jews. But he's in that position because of authority, influence, and money. And he has come up through the ranks in terms of the Roman, uh, Roman army, in terms of being a general and winning a lot of campaigns, proving himself to be an intellect, knowing how to judicate and to legislate. So Caesar, the emperor,
puts him in this position as governor. Normally, he doesn't want to be bothered with the Jews there in Jerusalem. But since this was a Passover, he went there to make an appearance in order to make it look like he was interested in the folk that he hated. Amen? Amen. When they send Jesus to Pilate, Pilate questions him, looks at him, and Pilate is thinking to himself, as far as I'm concerned, I don't even know why, why the council sent this man to us. This man ain't guilty of anything, and especially high treason, no capital punishment. So Pilate who was a political person. Now, you got to understand, whatever he does is for his benefit, for him to be elevated to, to uh, receive more influence and more power. So what he does, he sends Jesus to Herod. Now, Herod is actually, he's the one that's controlling Jerusalem. He's got his um, palace there and everything. Herod is a, uh, he is a, how can I say it? He's a man who loves to indulge in physical pleasure and enjoy himself. So when Jesus arrives with him, as far as Herod is concerned, Jesus is a clown. He's a joke. And he treats him in that, in that way. And he tells him, he said, if you are who you claim you are, you know, show me some miracles, you know, do, do, some, do some flips for me. Show me what you can do. Jesus, silent, does not say anything. So, Herod, in order to uh, satisfy in terms of his weird mindset, and in fact, in a way, from what history records, Herod was, was a sociopath, crazy. He had his soldiers to come up to Jesus and to start to yanking out his beard, whisker by whisker. Now, men, we can identify with this. What if somebody was to come up to you, and especially if you got some long hairs, and they start to jerking out your hair? from the roots. Now you know what's going to happen. It's going to bleed. It's going to hurt. It's going to swell, right? So when they get through plucking and ripping out his beard and laughing at him, then Herod says in so many words, I've gotten all the fun I can out of him. You know, you, you, you disgust me. So he sends him back to Pilate, the Sanhedrin, to Pilate, to Herod, then back to Pilate. Okay, Pilate was hoping that Herod would rid him of this man. He would not have to be bothered with him anymore. But he looks up, here comes Jesus again. Pilate knows he's innocent. Pilate knows he does not deserve to be hanged. So, he hates Jews now. He hates them. He doesn't want to be bothered with them. But he feels, well, they've already reported him to the emperor. He's already got one bad report. And he knows if he gets a second one, his position is in jeopardy, and he might lose all of that power, money, and, and, and all that influence. So, he thinks to himself, well, maybe I can satisfy them by not crucifying him, but doing some other things. So what they do, they take off his robe. They strip him naked. Now, these pictures that we have seen of Jesus on the cross with uh, his lawns girded and a halo about his head, that ain't what happened. He was naked on that cross. Naked. You understand? Well, no line, well, no cloth covering his uh, ex lower extremities. He was naked. That's the way they died in those days. 
that a person had to be humiliated, disgraced in the eyes of everybody looking at them. So they take off all of his clothes, they bind his hands, and then they bend him over a stone column, which is low, with his face to the floor. And then there's a man called a Lictor, L-I-C-T-O-R, who was nothing but an executioner. He takes what was known as a flagellum, which was a wooden handle about 12 inches long, and it had leather straps that were attached to it. And on the end of the leather straps, there were sewn in bone, and steel bits. They get Jesus. And normally for the average man. It didn't take but four minutes. Most of them couldn't even stand. The scourging and the flogging. They would die. Four minutes. When he gets through with Jesus' back. And shoulders. And neck. And head. There is nothing but a bloody river. You can see the bones in his back. You can see his spine. You can see the bones of his ribs. You can see his nerves standing out. A mass of blood. Now he's already, his face is already messed up when he was with Herod. And they yanked his beard out. When the lector gets through flogging him, then they put him on a robe and they wrap it around his waist because they say, well, since you are king, then you deserve a robe. Then they get a reed. And they said, a king needs a scepter. And they put the reed in his hand. And then kings also wear crowns, don't they? So they didn't get a real crown. They take thorns and they plait the thorns and then they gouge it down on his head. And those thorns that they used were something like about between three-fourths to three and a half inches long. And they dug into his scalp. Now here he is, blood flowing now. Face now is swollen. His back is nothing but a mass of, of flesh and blood. And you can barely recognize him. But he's fulfilling the scripture in Psalm 22, Psalm 69, and Isaiah 53 where it says that he will be beaten so badly until he didn't even look like a man when he hung on the cross. He didn't even look human when he hung on the cross. As they get through beating him, then Pilate is hoping that that is sufficient for the Jews. So at that particular time, always it was a custom to release a prisoner. Amen? And they are hoping, or he's hoping rather, that they would say to Pilate, release Jesus and keep Barabbas. But instead, they said, let Barabbas go, kill Jesus. Through all of this, he's fulfilling scripture. He is silent like a lamb led to slaughter. After all night, there's somewhere like about six o'clock now in the morning, he hasn't slept. He hasn't had anything to eat. Because of all the bleeding, what has he lost? A lot of fluids, right? He's weak. He's tired. Now they write on a placard what his crime was, which was notable in those days that when a person was a criminal 
they would give them a cross beam and they would put the cross beam on their shoulders and then they would hang around their neck what their crime was. So as they're walking through the streets and folk are looking at it, they'll know what they did. Look at it. He's just about ready physically to collapse. Six o'clock in the morning, the sun is coming up. His face is bleeding. His back, his back is nothing but just, you don't want to look at it. He's carrying a cross beam of wood. And can't you imagine with that cross beam of wood laying on his shoulders and his neck that have been ripped and have been bleeding and arteries have been exposed? That's the reason why they stop a black man and tell him, yeah, you got to carry his cross because he didn't have enough strength. Can carry that cross beam. When they get him to the hill, they take six inch spikes, steel spikes, and hammer them through his hands and through his feet. Turn his knees bent to the left so that he can push up and get out while he's on the cross. Then they nail the cross beam to a vertical beam and then they drop it in the earth. And he's hanging there between a thief here and a thief there. He utters three statements from the cross before 12 noon because it's about 9 o'clock now. And those three statements are Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And that's the reason why it's good that he died. Because if I'd been on that cross, I would have cursed them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then he commended John to take care of his mother. And he said, Mama, here's your son now, your adopted son. Carry her home, protect her, provide for her. And then he said to the thief, this day you're going to be with me where? In paradise. Then at 12 noon, something strange occurs that should not have occurred, a supernatural event. All of a sudden, there is darkness at 12 noon. And there's not supposed to be no eclipse at Passover time. But everything is black and eerie silence. And out of all of this chattering and people clamoring said, well, he claimed he was a king. Why, why doesn't he come down? Maybe he's waiting on his army to come. All of the insults they're hurling at him and they're spitting on him. At 12 noon is black. It's midnight. And nobody's saying anything because they had never seen nothing like this happen. And then out of the silence, we hear him say, four words or four statements in that silence. Because it's at 12 noon and when three o'clock comes, three hours later, he will be dead. All total taking all of the trial and the ordeal on the cross, 12 hours to kill him, to lie on him, to convict him. In the darkness, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know why he said that? Do you know what he was going through then? And I'm not just talking about the physical agony. Do you know what he was suffering then? He was suffering your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin. Everybody on the road, just look at one another and say, your sin, your sin. Everybody's sin here. That's what he was bearing at that moment. 
and the weight of the Father's wrath and anger was unleashed on him. He took all of that hell for us. I want you to understand what he went through. Then he said, I thirst. Matthew talks about a different thirst. There were two times they offered him wine at the beginning and then during the darkness. The first time, Matthew's rendition in Greek means fresh new wine. And it was mixed with galls, which was like a sedative, a narcotic, to dull the body so you couldn't feel the pain. He wouldn't take it. Why? Because he wanted to feel every every pain small medium size and great on that cross he wanted to feel everything physically mentally spiritually and emotionally he wanted to feel it for you and for me then after they gave him the sour wine which tastes like sour vinegar and he sucked it and his throat now is partially closed, but it's enough going down to somewhat alleviate all of the fluids he's lost because during all of this time, his muscles are cramping, pain in his hands, in his feet, and when he pushes up, to try to straighten up so the cramps won't be so bad, that hurts because he's pushing down on the nails on his feet. He can only hold that position so long, then he sinks back down, and that pulls on his hands. He's trying to get his breath to keep from suffocating, and he's up and down up and down until close to three o'clock. He comes out with the cry of a victor. It is finished. What was he talking about? The father had done all he was going to do in terms of his wrath condemning your sin and my sin. He had fulfilled the curse under the law that was done away with. He had defeated Satan even though Satan didn't know it. Satan had lost. And that's the reason why, and let, let, let me interject this real, real quickly, real briefly. And I may mention this in evangelism class. Don't ever be duped by these statements that you hear. You can take Satan and you can throw him down, you can stamp him under your feet. Don't you be fooled by that type of stupidity. You hear what I say? You cannot put Satan under your feet and destroy him. If that was the case, why did Jesus go through all that he went through to destroy him? If you could do it on your own. Doesn't make sense, does it? Plus, Satan is too small for that anyway. And I think sometimes we give him too much credit in one area, then we don't give him enough credit in another area. He ain't that stupid. He ain't going to let you do that to him. Amen. You cannot stomp him under your feet. He's a spirit. And I ain't never seen nobody stomp a spirit yet. Let me move on. I'm trying to dispel some of this nonsense that floats out there that you see on TV, you're on the radio, 
that's not biblical. After he says it is finished, he utters his last word, last statement. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's over with now. Everything is fine. He's gone through hell to keep us from going to hell. He has suffered to keep us from suffering on that cross. He's taken all the wrath of his father in terms of our sin where we should have been, where he was. He was our substitute. And he did it for you and for me. Now the question that I ask, do you think we're worth it? Do you think we are worth all of the suffering and the agony that Jesus went through? But undoubtedly, I guess he did. Because Paul again tells us, no greater love, as the choir was saying, have no man than this. <laughs> Lay down their life. And when Jesus laid down his life, it wasn't for a friend. Because we were his enemies. Because Paul tells again in Galatians, he said when he died, he tore down the wall, the middle partition between Jew and Gentile, so that there would be no more problems, and all of us, what, would become one in Christ. No north, south, east, west, none of that. All of us are God's children. And oh, I forgot to tell you, when he breathed his last, something else happened. And all oh, this was during the darkness. An earthquake. And I wish they had had seismographs then so they could have gauged the ferocity of that earthquake. But I'm assuming it had to have been about what on a scale 9, 10, 11, because rocks cracked open. The ground shook. It was just like the earth was revolting. Just like somebody when you eat bad food and it doesn't sell on your stomach, came back up. And something else happened. Not only was there an earthquake, but some graves popped open All right. and exposed the bodies of some dead folk. And Matthew tells us they were called saints. But now they didn't do nothing but just lie there. So I, I, I ain't got to the best yet. He died. Uh -huh. Joseph of Arimathea and uh, another disciple who was secret begged for his body, took it down, wrapped it in linen. John tells us that, uh, that um, they had about 100 pounds of spike now that they put between the bindings of the cloth of the body. That was like to embalm the body, mummified, laid him in a tomb. And then they sealed it with a stone that rolled on an incline and to make certain that the disciples who, this, who the uh, high priest thought that they had really more power than they did, they persuaded Pilate and Caesar to put a seal across the stone. And then it was sealed with the emperor's ring, right. which meant that if you try to move the stone, you're going to break the seal. And if you break the seal, then you will hang. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Then they had soldiers. <laughs> they, they wanted to make certain, this dude ain't going to get up. They ain't going to steal his body. 
So soldiers stood around all day, all night, all day, all night, all day, all night. Until Matthew tells us in chapter 28, as it began to dawn, and you know what the word dawn means, it means when darkness flees and light comes in. As it began to dawn toward what? The first day of the week, uh, Jesus' mama came, Mama Mary. Can I call her that? She ain't no saint. She's just like you and me. She got to be forgiven. Mama Mary came. And then there was another Mary. There was his aunt that was married to uh, Cleopas. And then there was Mary Magdalene. Three Marys. I don't know why in that day and time they loved name women Mary. But anyway, all three of them came to do some more anointing of the body. Put more spices on it. And lo and behold, what did they see? The stone was gone. Now, the angel didn't roll the stone back for Jesus to get out. Because Jesus had already gone before the stone was rolled. They, the angel rolled the stone back for them to look in. And what did they see? They saw the embalming clothes neatly laid with the imprint of his body that was in it. And then the head napkin that had been put around his head, it was lying separate in its place. Head napkin here, body claws here. And the angel was just sitting there. <laughs> Excuse me, Sister Watson. The angel, maybe I better go on to this one then. The angel, the angel was just sitting there. And when the ladies came and they looked in.